Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great show with a returning guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. I'm here with Nate Hockman of the National Review. Thanks for joining me, man. Hey man, it's good to be back. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to be getting into Nate's uh, piece today. He's been talking about this looming uh, idea of uh, transgender centrism. We're going to kind of break down some of the events we've seen here recently. We've got protests in front of the New York Times building. We've got people trying to, I think, turn the ratchet on this issue some. And so we're going to get deeper into that in just a second. But before we do, let's go ahead and talk about today's sponsor. Guys, I know a lot of you are working hard, taking care of yourself. You're working out, you're watching what you eat. And that's good because you have to start taking care of things like your liver. Some of the latest data coming out of the American Heart Association shows that adults with fatty liver are three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those who avoid it. And the American Liver Foundation says that over 100 million Americans already have fatty liver, which isn't too surprising given the modern diet today. So what does this mean? It means that you need to go ahead and watch out for some of the stuff that's impacting your liver, stuff like cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, lean on stuff like Tylenol, statins. All of this can have negative impacts on your liver, and that's why so many people have a sluggish, fatty liver that, help, that makes them gain weight and lose energy. Liver does all kinds of important thing, things for you, of course, and so there is a solution that you can try to help along with working out and taking your, care of yourself. You can look at supplements like Liver Health Formula. Liver Health Formula is an all-natural supplement which contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. It's manufactured right here in the United States and approved by American doctors. So if you're looking to go ahead and ignite some fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, and you're looking to transform just how you feel, you can try Liver Health Formula and receive five free gifts when you order today. First, you'll receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula to help reduce sugar cravings, and you'll also receive four free eBooks to help support every aspect of your health. You can go to try, you can try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash Oren and claim your five free bonus gifts. Again, that's getliverhelp.com slash Oren. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. Nate, looking at your piece this week, it was funny, or uh, last week, it's funny because I saw it just as other people were talking about kind of the the need to take another look at transgenderism, need to, need to calm things down a little bit. There needs to be kind of a central uh, or, or a centrist position where, you know, people get the rights and health care that they need, but, you know, their parents are involved in decisions or, so, or something like that. Tell me a little bit about what's going on and why people are suddenly pushing for this kind of moderate position on transgender, you know, transitioning for children. Yeah, you know, the, we've seen sort of pieces like this surface from time to time uh, over the last few years as transgenderism has become this kind of hot button culture war topic because you know as, as early or as late as 2016 it just wasn't as much of, a, of an issue in the national conscience as it is as it was sort of after 2018 but this is something that like, this kind of culturally moderate often elite center right does in every single culture war issue and it's always the sort of prelude to just full concession which is, well, we need to sort of seed some of the sort of progressive claims about this particular cultural agenda. You know, we need we can make concessions, we can negotiate, we can compromise. You know, it's the spirit of American pluralism. You heard that on, you know, debates over marriage. You heard that on debates over, uh, you know, gays in the military. Sometimes you still hear that about abortion. So it's sort of the, the reason that this bulwark piece that I was responding to, which is by an AEI fellow, uh, Giselle Donnelly, which was calling for basically a culture war truce on, on gender ideology. The reason it caught my eye is because I know that there are conservatives who are, who are interested in this kind of compromise position. And I think as it becomes more and more of a hot button issue, you're going to get more and more conservatives sort of losing their stomach for the fight. Um, so I'm optimistic because I think that the conservative movement writ large actually has really coalesced around a much more aggressive agenda on gender ideology than we've seen on past culture war issues, which makes sense because its claims are so patently insane. But you are going to see, uh, I think, more and more think pieces from this segment of the right that we saw in the bulwark, I think, at the beginning of this month from Giselle Donnelly basically saying, look, both sides are crazy, right? On the one hand, you have people 
uh, that want to, you know, uh, surgically mutilate 12 year olds. And on the other hand, you want, you have people who want to go back to the biological understanding of men and women a la 2012, right? I mean, <laughs> equally crazy size there, right? But that mm -hmm. kind of centrist position, it, it, it doesn't actually have any firm ground to stand on because whatever is centrist is, is just whatever's in the middle of the shifting ground and the ground continues to shift left. And eventually, particularly on the question of what is a man, what is a woman, conservatives just have to stake their flag and say, this is the definition and we're not going to go any further. Yeah, you could definitely feel that conservative case for trial uh, for childhood transitioning uh, build, building in the background. Mm -hmm. And and I think you're right. You can feel the, the attempt to to turn the ratchet on this one already. We've seen a lot of stories coming out of different conservative outlets about how you know, wokeness is over. It's near the end. We're almost done with this craziness, the, the transgender madness or all these other things. These things are dying down and it's only a, you know, a few more months of this and it'll, we'll all just go back to normal. You can already see the, the fatigue setting in, especially like you said, with there's a couple different uh, actors here, I think that are that are involved with this. Like you said, there's this the center right, very, very establishment liber libertarian esque right that just wants to say, well, you know, we're always a detente on social issues, and this is just another one. The left pushes, and we're the ones that say, ooh, slow down for a minute. Yeah. So you have those folks, and then you have others who you know maybe aren't from that crowd, but would much more would like to focus on other issues, and and really the culture war is not their their wheelhouse, or at least that this aspect of it isn't. And and so they're like, oh, man, I really just wish we could just stop talking about this and move on to anything else. And so we see kind of both of these forces working to, to kind of advance this idea. Now, uh, I think it'll probably be obvious for most people, but you, you laid out the case pretty well in your piece. So I wonder if you'll just make it to people real quick. Why isn't there a centrist position on this? Why, why is it impossible for there to be a centrist issue, uh, issue for an ideology that is basically designed from the ground up to destroy you know, the, the, the basic understanding and traditional understanding of families and, and culture and societal structure. Right. So there's sort of two reasons that there isn't anything that could conceivably be accurately described as transgender centrism. The first is the kind of meta issue that I was talking about before, which is that in the culture war, as the culture continues to gallop left, right, over the course of the three past three or four decades, where conservatives have lost decisively on every issue except for abortion. Um, the, the centrist position that gets staked out is just, it's just following that ground leftwards, right? It just is the middle of whatever the playing field happens to be. So if the culture war, as I believe it is, is actually this fundamental debate over first principles, over what truth is, the meaning of men and women, the meaning of marriage, the meaning of the nation state, um, American history, right? Like these fundamental core debates, there's a true position and there's a false position. And the true position doesn't change along with the trends of the time, right? So staking out a centrist position and and sort of uh, deciding what that centrist position is based on what happens to be considered left and what happens to be considered right in the kind of mainstream is not an actual principled position. It's kind of just squishy in the middle, uh, you know, me meaningless kind of uh, both sides are crazy, you know, stuff. Um, but the other thing is in, in the sort of particularities of the transgender issue, and this is what I was writing about in the piece, is this is in a, in a very real way the final frontier of the sexual revolution. It doesn't mean that there won't be more frontiers after this. <laughs> if we lose this one, I think it's going to get much darker, uh, if, and this, that's why the stakes are so high. But the, the premise originally of the sexual revolution was to liberate men and women from the kind of traditional circumscribed gender roles that we had as a society cultivated for them and the kind of political, economic, social, cultural structures that had kind of grown up to sort of cultivate, steward, reinforce those things. So once you had conquered those sort of traditional institutional gender roles, the next thing was to liberate men and women from the very institution of the meaning of marriage, uh, which is traditionally defined as between one man and one woman. The final frontier, and this isn't a totally original point by any means, but it's an important one, is literally the biological makeup of men and women themselves. And this is where things get really, really dark because it's no longer just dismantling institutions, changing cultural mores. It's an artificial technological assault on the human body itself. And it's dismantling not just the idea of men and women, but the actual basic evidence that men and women exist, which is literally written into the composition of male and female bodies. Uh, 
that is, there's no sort of moderate concession to that, right? There either are men and women or there aren't. Men and women exist as distinct entities or they don't exist. Uh, and if you believe that they don't exist, you are on the side of the transgender left. If you believe that they, you do exist, in the framing of this bulwark piece, at least, you're a right-wing radical if you're actually willing to enforce those ideas. Um, so, so moderation is kind of a, a siren song in this case. It's just a slightly slower, maybe not even that, concession to this trend. You know, there's, there's a very hard biological reality here, and you're either on one side of it or you're on the other. Yeah, if you're okay with turning kids into meat Legos and pretending like it's going to have no impact on them later on in life, then yeah, th there's really no way to pretend that you're somehow in the middle of this issue. But I think it's very interesting, you know, yesterday, uh, South Dakota state rep had a tweet talking about how uh, it's, it was un-American and dangerous to believe that the safest place for a child was in a uh, household with a married uh, mom and dad. And I think that just kind of shows you how moderation doesn't exist on any of this stuff. This is It's not just on this issue. All of this is, is always just a lie. It's always about getting the foot in the door and then accelerating as soon as possible once you can kind of get past those barriers. You, you, you had all this about, oh, well, you know, th this is just making the best of bad situations and we need to understand people where they are and blah, blah, blah. But you're only a few years down the road and all of a sudden it's, well, having any standard for what a family is or having any conception of the good that you know, having any standard by which you should expect people to behave themselves and raise children, even if they don't meet it all the time, is in itself deeply un-American. You know, it doesn't matter that this is something that's been part of America, of course, since its foundation. It's you know, it's the basic family unit that pretty much everything is built on top of. All of a sudden, this is this is too radical and too extreme and and, and anti-American. You know, history just kind of started you know ten years ago, and it feels like the same thing is happening here with the transgender movement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're told over and over again that the concept of a slippery slope is a fallacy. And it's like, how can you watch what happened over the course of the last two decades and still reach that conclusion, right? Like maybe in the abstract, in an esoteric sense, using you know, a slippery slope in a classroom argument or whatever could be a fallacy. But it's obviously true as a practical matter that, to your point, what moderation and concession actually means, even if it feels like a sort of moderate or meaningless concession in the moment, particularly when we get to the transgender issue, is just expediting a much more radical process and movement to dismantle like the basic building blocks of civilization. I mean, not just the building blocks of America, although obviously the American family has been the core of American society for most of our history, but of the entire Western civilization that America was sort of the culmination of, right? It's always been organized in some way, shape, or form around the family. And we've not only dismantled our conception of the family and the kind of institutional, legal, and economic structures that we built to support that, that understanding, we are now at the point where the only acceptable frontier left to conquer is universal homogeneity right? A complete wiping the slate clean of any distinctions or particularities between men and women whatsoever. And again, in practical, in, in sort of the practical context, that has really dark implications for how it affects children. I don't know if you saw the recent report about the Missouri uh, transgender clinic, but the sworn affidavit from a caseworker there who used to believe in this stuff is, just, is, is genuinely horrifying what they're doing to children, uh, often the most vulnerable mentally ill children in our society. But also, again, on a sort of first principles social level, if you have a breakdown of a society that's ordered around a, a recognition of very real and uh, distinctions that will exist whether or not our culture recognizes them or not, uh, you have a society that's organized around uh, lies, around falsehoods, rather than around truth. Um, and that, again, leads to very dark places very quickly. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how even some of the activists who have been trying to push against this are making classic conservative mistakes, even if they themselves are not terribly conservative. A guy, a guy like Andrew Sullivan, who is now for some reason labeled a conservative by by many people. But the same day that you were you know, printing your piece, he was out there praising a Washington Post piece saying oh this is a this is a sane and, and humane piece this is this is something that brings you know real sanity to the situation why oh because it said that parents should be involved if a child is thinking about 
transitioning. N not saying we should have restrictions or, you know, the, no, just saying, well, but, you know, someone should probably check with the parent first before they decide to mutilate the, the, this child. Right. And it's amazing because Andrew Sullivan is somebody who, of course, is famous for his, you know, his assistance in, in destroying the definite, traditional definition of marriage. But he has been very hot recently over the fact that these, uh, you know, gender clinics are obviously oftentimes targeting what would probably grow up to be gay men, right? And as a gay man, he recognizes this as an existential threat. Okay, we're basically wiping out the gay population by transitioning them all to, you know, uh, to females, you know, it, through, through surgery or whatever. And he says, okay, this is this is an existential threat to something I hold dear, something I care about. I, he fought for gay marriage and then, you know, his movement decided to get rid of gay men. So what does that really mean at the end of the day, right? But here he is after making all of these pat, impassioned arguments about getting rid of this stuff and how dangerous it is saying, well, maybe we can you know, like find some common ground as long as someone checks with a parrot first. Right. Uh, there, there's a saying, I think I've seen you tweet it out before. It's like the revolution has to stop at the operating table, right? Like yeah, right. you don't get to pick and choose. Once you're sliding down the slope, you don't get to pick and choose like an off point. Like the momentum is happening. You open the door, you know, whoever you're, I'm, you're talking about here, whatever conservative sort of militated for concessions. And you don't get to sort of wake up a decade later and go, whoa, 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 you know, this is this is out of control now, right? It's like that was always what it was going to be about. And if you're still operating on the premise that you can actually negotiate with the revolution, you don't really understand what the revolution is and what its aims are, right? It's fundamentally what its aims are is the dismantling and the destruction of Western civilization. And actually, in their most honest moments, these activists are very explicit about that. The, the sort of radical transgender activists that this bulwark piece I was responding to cited as, as the example of the extreme left was uh, this ACLU transgender activist saying, um, you know, criticizing the legalization of, of, of gay marriage because marriage is a fundamentally violent institution and we need to dismantle it altogether, right? Like it, they're coming for the very building blocks, the very sort of core institutions and structures of Western civilization. And, you know, saying that, that you can compromise with that fundamental goal is to completely ignore the nature of the goal itself. So look, I, you know, I, Andrew Sullivan and I, we've never met, we're mutuals on Twitter. I give him credit for being much more self-aware than I think some other activists who don't want to admit to themselves, you know, effectively what they've wrought. He is clearly horrified <laughs> by the cultural left today, in, at least in some, in some areas. Uh, but I think, you know, people like that have to ask themselves and do some real introspection about how we got here. And the conclusion that any rational analysis will arrive at is that we couldn't have gotten here if we didn't make those earlier concessions. And it's insane to me that we're still talking about making concessions today, because if this is what we're uh, caught up with in 2023 and we continue to make concessions, what is it going to look like in 2033? I, I mean, I really I, I shudder at the thought. And I think that's pre precisely why there's a there's a moment now where conservatives have to draw a bright red line and stand by it. Yeah, I don't know how aware Sullivan is because he's always defending like drag string queen story hour. But anyway, yeah, so I've just seen his yeah. anti woke tirades. As I well. got you. Yeah, no, I mean you're you're right. He he is often in this almost in this kind of IDW you know liberal yeah. that was mugged by reality you know uh, scenario where he it's the it's the newest version of neoconservatism and then the, it's it's I'm probably here to stay unfortunately for a while. But uh, I I don't know. Uh, where was, I had something before I got sidetracked there, uh, but uh, well, now I completely forgot. Anyway, <laughs> see, I was distracted by, uh, uh, by you know, yeah. all this. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a continuous need uh, to kind of uh, look at the. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, there, there's a, a Martin Bailey that's always being played with the revolution, right? It's always well, we only have a little bit of. Uh, you know, we're, we're just fighting for a particular right, a particular cutout, a particular functional thing that allow people to live the way they want to live or, or or have better lives. And then you always see like when no one's looking or when they feel strong that actually this is, like you said, part of a revolution that is aimed directly at society. One of the things I really like is if you go back and read uh, a lot of kind of edgy Marxists, even guys like Nick Land that eventually became far, far more right wing, they'll just openly say things like we really support the feminist movement because it dissolves the family and dissolving the family is key to Marxist 
uh, agenda moving forward. Like we can't have, you know, fully automated space luxury communism until we dissolve the family in its entirety, because if we don't dissolve the family, then we can't dissolve national borders. So that, so it's funny that people who are like are explicitly out to destroy you know, Western civilization tell you blow for blow, like, no, we need to get rid of gender def gender roles so then we can later get rid of gender definitions so we can later destroy the family so we can later undermine the stability of the state. So finally we can, you know, melt down all these borders, homogenize everyone and kind of create this global communist utopia. So they're not really very, like you said, very coy about what they want to do when they think that, you know, they can get away with it. They, they'll just run back to these, uh, to these safe arguments about, oh, well, at the end of the day, it's making sure that people can see each other in, in the hospital or something, or make sure that someone right. can get adopted. But, and, but you see really when, when, you know, everything's, the cards are down on the table, they know exactly what they're doing. And this is fully intentional. Exactly. And this is why I think it's really important for conservatives to actually read the kind of uh, intellectual heavyweights of the actual hard left, because they're just much more honest than the ostensibly sort of moderate sort of technocratic, you know, New York Times editorial board progressives. Their goals are fundamentally the same, uh, maybe with slightly more moderation, although oftentimes there's really no distinction in terms of the moderation versus radicalism. Uh, the rhetoric is different and the honesty with which they deliver their goals is different, obviously. But, you know, the, the, the Mott and Bailey thing is one of the most, mo most sort of um, significant things that conservatives fall for because they mm -hmm. take progressives at their word that that's not really what it's about. Where if you actually, you don't have to even read radical leftists. If you actually just look at the, the substantive nature of what they're militating for, and you follow that to its logical conclusion, it's obviously what it's about. Um, there's, I think there are a lot of kind of sort of quote unquote center left progressives who authentically believe that their end goal isn't, you know, the destruction of Western civilization or whatever. And when they scoff at conservatives making that allegation and accuse them of being hysterical, they probably largely think that, that they are being hysterical. But if you, act, again, if you actually look at what their substantive goals are, it is a kind of radicalism that began on campuses in the 1960s and sort of seeped out and, you know, militated this long march to the institutions that has been absorbed into the kind of language and um, idiom of like moderate progressivism. So moderate progressivism now is basically just a euphemistic sort of veil on the much more radical ideological project. There isn't really moderate liberalism like there used to be. There are plenty of problems with moderate left liberalism as well largely because it actually couldn't put up a fight against the radicals once the radicals came calling, but uh, it doesn't exist at all anymore. And even the sort of ostensibly moderate Democrats, for example, are, are militating in the cultural sphere, at least, for something that was confined to the most radical student activists in the 1960s. One of the statistics I, I, I always point to is the fact that every single House Democrat, including the one from red districts and purple districts, except for one, voted uh, for the Equality Act. And if you know anything about the Equality Act, it's basically the end of First Amendment conscience rights in America. That's actually, you know, it, what it does is it, it writes uh, sexual orientation and gender ideology into federal civil rights law uh, with no religious liberty protections whatsoever. An earlier bill with religious liberty protections, it, it got taken out, uh, which effectively means that if you are any kind of dissenter in the public square, in a publicly funded institution, a teacher, a coach, et cetera, et cetera. You want federal funding for your you know, business. Uh, if you are critical of gender ideology, uh, you're effectively persona non grata, reduced to the class of a second class citizen. The quote unquote moderate Democrats all voted for that, which have, would have been inconceivable even a couple of decades ago. So it's much more deceptive when they talk and they sort of deliver their messages about equality for trans people and LGBT people, et cetera. Uh, but it fundamentally is all pulling in the same direction and working towards the same goals. And conservatives need to actually understand that if they're going to effectively confront it. Yeah, like you said, it's so easy for people to get focused on those near arguments and, and just not follow things to logical conclusion. You're constantly shamed for just noticing the obvious. And 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 they really love to do this. They love to code this as as low class, right? Oh, if you if you notice something very obvious that when we suggest one thing, it will ultimately lead to another to another, you're just some hysterical hysterical backwards yokel. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is also why you need to pass this stuff into civil rights law with no religious liberty protection because you know, it, the, the point is to make it impossible 
for people of faith or just anyone with an opposing opinion to be able to interact with almost any public institution because of course all corporations all you know all public institutions all of this stuff must abide by this dictate and so if you can you know write this into civil rights law as it stands then you can make sure that basically no person with any real conviction is able to you know have a bank account or work at a major corporation or have a job in the you know in the US government any kind of position it's effectively purges society of this without even have to, having to, you know, no gulags are necessary. You can just make sure your thought criminals can't process a payment or get a job or get a, a mortgage. And then, you know, they're, they're just homeless people who can't afford to have families, but you know, they're, they're free, right? They have, they have liberty. So that's fine. Yes. And this is the enormous power of the kind of civil rights state in general is what it did is it took the managerial revolution. I know you and I have talked about James Burnham before that began decades prior which was basically the bureaucratization of all of American society, the fusing of what had previously been private business with government, uh, the replacement of kind of entrepreneurial small regional firms with these massive corporate bureaucracies, multinational corporations, and then obviously the admin administrative state and government and created this new class of, of managerial elite whose claim to power was kind of technocratic administration. What the civil rights state did was it basically injected that with increasingly radical cultural left politics. So even as the managerial regime consolidated power over American society, and it became increasingly difficult to just participate in American life without coming into contact with and often being a subject of the managerial regime, uh, the diktats around cultural uh, uh, leftism became much more uh, stringent and radical. And again, with the Equality Act, what you're looking at in many ways is the sort of final frontier of that where not only are, uh, you know, people who have traditional conservative views about marriage, you know, facing, uh, you know, complete uh, marginalization from the public square. Now, anyone who doesn't think a man can become a woman, or even more radically, that a 12 year old with a mental illness should be pumped full of puberty blockers as the first resort, uh, will also not have access to like the basic aspects of, of po not just political, but sort of social participation, to your point, payment processors, obviously a job, uh, you know, you know, the, the technology, the sort of Silicon Valley apparatus, all of that is is uh, inextricably linked to the managerial regime and by extension, the civil rights state and the continued radicalization of, of, of that apparatus means the continued radicalization of American society writ large, because in many ways it is the commanding heights of American society writ large. Those are the stakes. Right. So to return to the original uh, point about centrism, what is the moderate position there? Right. If the moderate position is a concession to that, it's it's just you know progressivism driving the speed limit, uh, to use the popular phrase. Um, you have to actually actively resist it, and you have to be willing to be accused of being a radical or a yokel, you know, or you know being marginalized from mainstream institutions that buy into this stuff, uh, because the alternative really is the destruction of American, ultimately Western civilization, which I happen to like, <laughs> and I would I would rather I would rather live in a world where it still exists, um, but that requires taking what could be conceived of as a radical position sometimes. Yeah, and it's interesting that the Republicans, you know, the you know, just kind of the establishment right, didn't know what to do with this when it first came up. You, I don't know if you remember, you know, the Caitlyn Jenner emerges, and all of a sudden the right wing's like, "Well, we've got one of our own now," uh, you know, as they so often do. Uh, the the left has discovered a favorite class, and we've discovered a member of the favorite class that's willing to defect to us. So now we understand how to handle this. And so for a while, that seemed like that was the tact. We're going to run Caitlyn Jenner for the uh, for for you know. Uh, governor of New York or whatever, you know, they, they were trying to, to sell at the time. And then slowly but surely, the kind of the understanding of what was going on and where the base was going to force them to go with this kind of came upon them. But it's interesting that at the beginning of this, they didn't seem to have any particular pushback against it. And I think that that's really indicative of kind of the corporate connection with the Republican Party, especially, you know, speaking of Burnham and the managerial revolution, one of the things that Francis, uh, Sam Francis, really focused on and expanding on Burnham was that he pointed out that the the need to homogenize was, of course, a key part of Burnham's managerial revolution, but he expanded this particularly into cultural and social issues, right? So you needed to go ahead and make sure that everyone had the same kind of hedonistic values. They didn't have anything uh, specific and particular to a religion or a culture or a tribe or anything that would require people to live a different way. And of course, 
you know, people who are interchangeable and constantly looking to consume new identities are particularly good customers for large bureaucratic organizations that constantly want to sell them things and want them kind of on an internal uh, wheel of, of consumption when it comes to drugs and, and clothes and, and surgeries and all the all this other aftercare, mental uh, care that would be necessary after all these radical procedures. And so it was very easy sell, I think, for most uh, corporations and, of course, you know, places like AEI that push, you know, uh, corporate liberalism uh, to say, oh, well, you know, th this is something we're on board with. We don't have any kind of uh, philosophical uh, opposition to this. And I think that's why you, you saw that holding power pattern from, you know, the establishment GOP and, and others in the conservative movement early on, because they're like, well, business seems to like this. They don't seem to have any problem. And now we just see this being, you know, speaking out against this will get you, you know, destroyed and any corporate boardroom will get you fired from any corporation. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we realize, oh, maybe we do have to push against this because its ubiquity is just so much that it's impossible for half the country to function in normal everyday life. Exactly. And I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up neoconservatism earlier because it's sort of inextricably linked to what neoconservatism is. Now, <clears throat> today, everyone thinks of neoconservatism as uh, foreign policy hawkishness, basically. Right. And it is that, but that's not, it didn't begin, begin as, a, as a foreign policy um, ideology at all. Um, it was the kind of liberals who were mugged by reality. But what the first generation of neoconservatives explicitly said, this is not an like a you know spurious accusation, and this is their words. If you read Irving Crystal, this is what he says. He says, uh, you know, Crystal wrote a bunch of essays where he's like, well, we never really stopped being liberals. Mm -hmm. You know, we um we we really just sort of uh, reappropriated uh, you know liberal goals, but we are you know championing more conservative ends, et cetera, more moderate liberalism, et cetera. And as neoconservatism came to dominate kind of mainstream conservative institutions, and then ultimately the GOP, those basic liberal premises and assumptions seeped into the kind of dominant mainstream, you know, what is colloquially called conservatism, Inc., but really is just the kind of nucleus or the, the ethos that the, the mainstream Republican Party and, and its attendant institutions swim in. So what the neoconservatives sought was accommodation with rather than reaction against the managerial regime. That was what was different about neoconservatism, again, in their own words, not mine, uh, than the kind of old right or the traditional conservatism. Um, and what that means is, is ultimately that the managerial ideology, which seeks homogeneity to your point, because it's much more easy to technocratically administer an entire nation and ultimately an entire world that is wiped clean of any distinctions between regions, between cultures, between men and women, ultimately, all of that is sort of subsumed into this, you know, homogenous universalistic managerial state. Um, and that kind of technocratic impulse never really was left behind by neoconservatives. They just wanted to reach those goals via, you know, child tax credits or, uh, you know, targeted tax cuts in opportunity zones, right? Like all these things that we hear about from these institutions, if you actually hear about how they frame it, it's fundamentally about reaching liberal egalitarian goals. And the only uh, sort of counterpoint they have is that conservative policies are the better way to reach those goals. They share the same basic premises. So to the point about Caitlyn Jenner, you did have this Democrats are the real transphobes moment for a second. Mm. I think we've mostly left that behind, uh, thankfully, but it's, it's, it's indicative of the same basic impulse over and over again. What mainstream Republicans and kind of establishment conservatives are saying is, no, we basically agree with what you want. Uh, we just think that our policies are a better way to achieve them. Um, that's not what I'm interested in. I have very different goals uh, than the left, and it's not a means-ends debate for me. It's a means-and-ends uh, debate. And ultimately, the ends are really what's important in these debates. Um, so that, that kind of concession to sort of managerial technocracy is not conservative in the traditional sense of the word, and it's also completely ineffective as a, as a mode of resistance against the managerial regime. Yeah, for some reason, it never strikes people that so many of the rocked rib conservative leaders started their conservative journey by saying, well, I didn't leave the left, the left left me, right? Guys like Ronald Reagan, you know, said this, and it never occurs to them that, oh, that means these people still <laughs> see themselves in the same position as where when they thought of themselves as leftists, and there's no real lesson to learn. They just think that the revolution went too far, like you said, had different means. And again, to, to kind of look at Francis's uh, dissection of the managerial state. He said the neoconservative movement, 
you know, kind of fails because it, it fails, like you said, to directly challenge managerial apparatus. It's always about how to properly, and he, he disagreed a little bit. He said that they do have maybe some slightly more conservative goals, but he said that because they refuse to, because they want to turn the managerial apparatus in their favor, they want to redirect it towards their ends rather than the more radical ends of the liberal vanguard, that that's how they're going to oppose it. But they have no real, uh, no real attack on managerialism themselves, no alternative, no real critique of the process, what the problems are and what the solutions could be, which kind of dooms them from the outset because they're always just going to kind of be these sheepish guys running behind the movement saying, hey, if we only did it slightly differently, it could come out better, but they don't really have any, any true uh, issues with how the mechanisms themselves are working. Right, and, and you saw the culmination of this again right around the time of the Bush era where they started you know, meeting with with left wing, um, you know, racial activists, for example, and saying, well, we also want sort of racial egalitarianism and we're going to do it only through, you know, opportunity zones, school choice, et cetera. Right. Like, I, I mean, school choice is great. Um, I, I, I support things like child tax credits even. Right. But the the seeding of the basic premise that the goal of public policy is social engineering to achieve egalitarian outcomes is a radical uh, departure a, from, you know, the basic conservatism a la the old right, and even the first sort of generation of conservatives. Francis had a very interesting relationship with Buckley. Like, he was critical of him, but I think he was less critical of him than people think. Like, he sort of saw the first, he, he saw a lot to like in the first generation of conservatives. And then the when neoconservatism t- took over, he became much more polemic. But regardless, the, the, the sort of seeding of that basic premise that public policy should be social engineering towards egalitarian ends means you've already, you've already lost the war, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're working, you know, to the same sort of homogenous society and, and what grounds do you have to object to something like transgenderism when it comes along, right? Because the left can call your bluff legitimately. They can say, well, you, you said you want egalitarian outcomes too. You want to use public policy uh, for egalitarian outcomes as well. So you see this, you know, uh, it's pervasive in conservative discourse now, right? You hear people talk about, well, abortion is systemic racism. Uh, the welfare state is systemic racism. Uh, public schools are systemic racism. Minimum wage is systemic racism. And what that relies on implicitly is like the Ibram X. Kendi premise that any policy that has disparate racial impact is systemic racism and that this is a systemically racist country, ultimately, uh, which again is a massive succession. There's a, there's a, um, statement from the House GOP, I think it was the, the Commerce uh, Committee in 2020, there's touting that under the Trump economy, women's wages have risen faster than men's wages and women of color's wages has risen faster than both of them. And it's like, oh, is that what conservatism is now? Right? Like it's, it's yeah. making sure that, you know, women are richer than men, which we know empirically, uh, you know, reduces marriage rates, which I thought conservatives cared about. Right. But it's all trying to make their case for themselves and their policies to the left which is never going to love them. Uh, but it's a function, I think, of the strata they occupy and that a lot of them come from. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, the GOP uh, did a uh, main account on Twitter, had a, a tweet a few days ago about how the GOP was going to do all of these things for the black community and all, you know, you're going to uh, make sure that you have the opportunity for businesses and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, so actually the GOP is just fine with identity politics. It's more than fine for racial pandering. Like you said, it, it, the GOP only knows how to talk in the frame of the left, no matter how much it complains about the frame of the left, it's always talking about, oh, well, the, you know, civil rights. Uh, the, well, this we have to phrase, frame this thing as a civil right for it to be important, or this has to benefit these specific protected, you know, uh, communities and classes if it's going to be of any value at all. And so we have to focus on those things using language that, of course, they would never, you know, dream of using for other communities. But of, of course, the Republican Party is, is really just a collection of things that the left lets them do, right? They don't have any particular principles when they talk about all this, all this junk about, oh, we, you know, we, we got to be colorblind and we don't care about, uh, you know, pandering to different communities and we don't believe in identity politics. Well, actually, that lasts about 14 seconds. And then you've got Nikki Haley talking about how only a woman can do this job, yeah. right? Like it, they're immediately jumping right back into left wing frame and left wing tropes, because at the end of the day, like you said, they're far more interested in making sure that they don't transgress any of the barriers the left has put up than actually coming up with a game plan to, I'd say, I don't know, beat the left at something. 
Yeah, the conservative girl boss iteration thing is one of the most uh, <laughs> obnoxious things, just viscerally for me, right? Like you see it from uh, obviously Nikki Haley, you see it from Christy Nome, you see it from uh, Nancy Mace. There are plenty of of uh, you know Republican women who are actually really staunch conservatives. So it's not to, to sort of impugn them, but there is a uh, a cadre of uh, often more culturally moderate um, Republicans who talk that way, um, and it. And again, it's like, who is this for? Who is the target of this, right? Do you think like a Republican base voter, like, you know, a non-college educated, uh, you know, I unionized iron worker in like rural Michigan is going to be like, yeah, like you, that's right. Like only a woman can do this, right? And it's like, no, you're talking to the New York Times editorial board. Like right. That's who your audience is. And the New York Times editorial board doesn't like you and it hates your voters. And the fact that you are more interested in what they think ultimately than what your voters think and what your interests to your voters are says a lot about, A, the social strata that you occupy and the worldview that, that you're a proponent of. You don't, it's not you know, a conspiracy theory. You don't have to look very closely to see um, you know, how, uh, how that operates. So there are divisions in, in Republican elite politics, too. Like There are Republican politicians who don't do this and, um, and, and even push back against it. But the fact that it is prominent in the kind of elite sphere of the Republican Party in a way that there's no sort of inverse comparison for on the Democratic end um, says a lot about how power actually operates in America. And it's very much uh, uh, operated with and for or by and for the left and against the authentic right. Yeah, it's so interesting that you mentioned the New York Times editorial board there, because, of course, today the New York Times is catching a lot of heat. Uh, they they printed like what an article or two that wasn't completely 100 percent glowing in every possible way about like, you know, transitioning children. And all of a sudden, this has created quite the uproar. There are hundreds of their contributors, I believe, who've who've issued a letter of uh, condemnation. Glad is outside of their offices today with one of those billboard rolling electronic billboard trucks, talking about how the New York Times is is dangerous and you can't question anything about the the trans movement. Like just just imagine that the the most mild pushback imaginable from one of the most left left wing organizations you can again imagine being something that sends people into like this complete apoplectic spiral but what do you think about this uh, this sudden need to strike back against the incredibly right wing new york times well the other mortal sin that they committed is they hired david french who's <laughs> that radical all yeah who is no is a rabid you know frothing at the yes. mouth <laughs> a transphobe right winger um no but that was actually i mean i wrote a blog post about this new york times um a letter against the New York Times by New York Times contributors today. Uh, and I was pointing out this talking point is the culmination of this kind of gathering talking point that you've seen pop up increasingly over the last few months, uh, which is that uh, on, on trans issues, specifically the New York Times is basically, it has a right wing editorial slant against transgender people. Um, and there was a post by a former Media Matters, matter, Ma Media Matters editor um, on her blog last month that was titled something like, uh, with hiring of anti-trans writer, New York Times declares war on LGBT people. Who was the anti-trans writer? David French, right? Yeah, hiring David French is declaring war on LGBT people. Um, Mr. Blessings of Liberty, you know, yeah. <laughs> himself. Marriage, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. really uh, real hard, hard line right winger. Um, but again, to, it, it, what it indicates is that this is how power works in America, particularly in the culture sphere. And what the, this, I think it's now more than 200 signatories, this open letter, you know, going after the, the New York Times, they're not interested actually in balance, right? Like empirically, if you look for five seconds at what New York Times coverage of transgender issues is like, it's obviously left wing. Um, what they are motivated by is the sense that this is their newspaper, right? And, and giving any conservative a hearing is a, an unacceptable concession to the right. Uh, and that's what bias is. So I was jokingly saying today, there's that um, saying you always uh, see it like BLM protests, which is uh, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Like right. that's actually what it was, right? It was right. like you publish like one anti-trans piece, right? And it's like, this is bias, right? Because you're accustomed to complete ideological conformity because it's your newspaper. Um, and, and that's why it feels so biased because there was outrage about like two reported pieces that actually gave a fair hearing 
to conservative activists and like Ross Douthat <laughs> writing an anti-trans piece, right? Ross Douthat is way more right-wing actually, to be fair, than I think the New York Times would ever hire today. Um, but the fact that he exists there is a, is a subject of sort of unending teeth gnashing uh, for progressive activists. And it's not because they want you know, a fair and balanced coverage, it's because it's their newspaper and the right is supposed to be boxed out of it completely. Yeah, I would say what you meant about Ross Douth, that he does have some level of actual conservatism. You know, I, I disagree with him on plenty, but yeah, that that is a huge problem for them. It's interesting because I think they love this moment, actually. I think they're desperate for this moment because the left wing vanguard is so boring today, right? Like, what, what, how are you radically left at this point? Radically left of what? The president of the United States who wants to enshrine the right of child transition into civil rights law? How are you getting to the left of this guy, right? <laughs> like, how is that even possible? Or at least the people who operate him, you know? But it, it, it's amazing that, you know, the left-wing vanguard, if you're some guy who wants to be a rebellious college kid on the left, like, where do you even go? And so I think they love these moments because they get to pretend for a moment that there's some kind of struggle, right? Like, yet yeah, the, the good old days when we, we had to harass the mainstream in order to get them to listen to us, you know, GLAD is itself just corporate leftism. And they're out there pushing against another piece of corporate leftism, the New York Times, in the hope of what? Like pushing the New York times towards a position they basically already hold anyway. It, it's a lot of theater, but I think they, they love the moment because it means they get to kind of, you know, put, put the old saddle back on the, on the revolutionary horse and ride it out for one more, uh, one more show before they have to kind of retire the whole thing. It's ridiculous. It's almost entirely theater, but, but it does give them that moment of pretending that, you know, that they are, there are still revolutionary moments. There is still a need to get out in the streets and fight back that kind of thing. Yeah, the revolution happened 50 years ago, guys. Like, you know, right. hang it up, <laughs> right? You're in, you're in uh, you know, tenured positions at Ivy League universities and, you know, Times Editorial Board now. Um, but it is, it's play acting at radicalism because they still think of themselves as radicals. And in an important sense, they are radicals insofar as their goals are radical and are, uh, you know, the, the Latin root of the word radical is like, is, is literally root, like uprooting something, right? Like what they're trying to do is uproot the, the core basis of American civilization. And they've been, done a, a decent job at it for the last 50 years. Um, but the it's it's always just sort of funny to me to hear the language of, uh, you know, protecting the most marginalized and, and fighting, you know, the power structures in America from these people when it's like, what you're talking about is a bunch of podunk rural, and, and I don't mean podunk like, you know, in a derogatory sense, but just literally like rural state legislatures in red states uh, who are paid like $14,000 a year, you know, for their legislation and are up against the most powerful institutions in the United States, the you know national teachers unions, all these major powerful activist groups with an army of phalanx of litigators, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the rest of the legacy media, one of the two nations, the nation's two major political parties, and, you know, at least a quarter or a half of the other one, uh, Silicon Valley, you know, big tech, like, that's what they're facing. And they're courageous enough, some of these state legislators, to actually take that on. But the, the, the reframing of it as the, the powerful being the marginalized and the actual marginalized being the powerful um, is, is essentially a psyop. It's, it's basically a way to justify continue, continual abuse of power and continual marginalization of the actual marginalized people in America um, in pursuit of ideological goals. It's worked out pretty well for them for the last few decades. Uh, I, I think conservatives are starting to sort of, um, at least some conservatives are starting to sort of wake up to, to how this dynamic works. Uh, but we've, we've got a long way to go. Did you see, uh, speaking of like sad attempts at rebellious activism, did you see the <laughs> the satanic temple showing up to the Idaho state legislature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only saw like pictures and like tweets. So I don't know that much about it, but it was amazing. Yeah, they, they, they were there to, to protest a bill that would keep, you know, child transitioning from happening or you, you sorry, you can't pump eight year olds full of of uh, puberty blockers. And of course, these people are 100 percent on board with this because, you know, satanic temple. By the way, guys, <laughs> there is no such thing as ironic Satanism. Like all <laughs> Satanism is just just real Satanism. Um, but uh, it's just that Satanism has always been lame. Uh, so uh, the thing is, like, you see these guys and they're all standing around and it looks like like maybe the world of Warcraft servers were down. You know, like, like everybody there was just, it was just, you know, they, they couldn't have been edgy if they tried. They were the softest, weakest, 
the least scary people in the world. But yeah, they we're Satanists here to, to, to fight against this thing. That just shows you how uh, performative and ridiculous this stuff is. When your temple of Satan is like on board with all this stuff, they're, they're calling it their own rituals so that they can get it justified in all these different areas and try to do constitutional workarounds. I mean, th again, thank you for properly labeling this stuff. Appreciate the, I really appreciate the formalization. It makes it a lot easier. But also it's just it's funny how sad it is, like how impossible it is for these people to be rebellious anymore sorry like you like you're the ones in power you're the mainstream it's very obvious and it's it's hilarious that when these people gather together and try to look menacing or oh we're fighting it, it's like no you're, you're just you're just terrible larpers it's, it's embarrassing yeah you know at least the, the 1960s radicals were you know the black panthers were edgy they were scary right yeah. you know they walked around their neighborhoods with uh with shotguns and they got out you know they got into like deadly shootouts with the cops right like do, do does anyone think like the you know 26 year olds who like spend you know uh, you know i don't know like spend you know the 12 hours a day in their basement like you know showing up at the uh at this idaho state capitol with you know plenty of positive coverage in the national media etc do you think they you know get into deadly shootouts with cops probably not like angela davis who was, you know, almost on the College Board AP African American Studies curriculum until uh, DeSantis said nothing doing. Uh, she was an accomplice in like a murder, murder kidnapping and was on the top of the FBI's most wanted list and was a fugitive from the law. Right. Like she's crazy. I think she her ideas are awful for America, but like that's edgy, you know, like you're actually participating in something with real stakes. Like now it's a perfect this is actually a perfect sort of a analogy for the, the development. She's she's like a professor emeritus at one of the University of California schools. Right. Like that is exactly how this works. All of the actual radicals in the 60s either died you know, they went off or to live on like, you know, communes and farms in like rural Oregon, or they got tenured positions at the top universities and, you know, at the, at the editorial board of the New York Times to continue spewing their ideas. Um, so, so that sort of radical dissent uh, doesn't exist when all of the powerful institutions are on your side. Uh, and it's, 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 again, it's the, the reason they keep doing that, I think is partially psychological, because it's, fun to play act of being a radical and partially because it gives them a, an effective cover for the exercise of power. You know, the, one of the weird phenomenons in America today is we have an elite that insists that it's not the elite and that allows it uh, to be sort of all oblige, no oblige, right. And to exercise its power in increasingly tyrannical ways um, because it's uh, sort of shrouded from the perception that it's actually in power when it obviously is. Yeah, we kind of had that weather underground uh, pipe bomb to college elite professor pipeline for a while there. But yeah, it, it's true that the the kind of the oligarchical nature of our distributed power network right now means that everyone gets to pretend, you know, billionaires are, are walking around with, you know, T-shirts and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, and jeans from Old Navy pretending like they don't rule the, the yeah. you know, s s large chunks of the world. College professors are, yeah, we're, we're, we're the oppressed, even though we can cancel any human being on the planet at any moment. This is just a constant feature of our society, unfortunately, and you have to bring some level of accountable accountability to these organizations, which is, you know, why it's great to see guys like Chris Rufo doing what they're doing in yeah. places like Florida, because you really hope that this builds a model for conservatives on how they can kind of bring these institutions to heal and uh, and kind of generate a leadership class with a, with a little more accountability and a little more groundedness to, to what's going on. Uh, but that said, uh, we've got quite a few uh, Super Chats stacking up. Before we pivot over to those, Nate, can you tell people where to find your work? Yeah, just Twitter. Um, I would advise against following me, but if you must, it's at <laughs> NJ Hawkman, N-J-H-O-C-H-M-A-N, and I post anything relevant I do on there. Excellent. All right, let's go over to the people's questions here. We've got Glow in the Dark for $5. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the slippery slope uh, slope only works one way. If you're uh, opposed to leftism, you'll eventually become a Nazi or authoritarian projection by the left to undercut them. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, there's this idea that if you have any subtle opposition to the left, there's only one way for you to go, and that's become some kind of crazy fringe right winger actually funny enough uh i'm gonna probably do a stream on this tomorrow npr just did a uh an article about how christian nationalism is on the rise the, the idea that the you know that the united states should be a christian nation is this dangerous new idea that's sweeping the country All, almost half of republicans believe this uh oh okay so half of the conservative party believes this thing that has been 
the major belief in the United States through almost its entire history. Yes, crazy and radical, right? But that's what they do. They get to reframe every bit of this as some kind of radical insurgency, um, which, you know, maybe that makes, uh, you know, conservatism sound more exciting than it is. Who knows? Maybe that's a good recruitment troll. But that is certainly their aim is to just make any, any even the most mild pushback, nothing but uh, a straight pipeline to authoritarianism. Yeah. Right. And the number of Republicans who actually think that America should be a Christian country, because I've written a little bit about this, uh, has been declining because the Republican base is secularizing, which is its own problem, which is a completely yeah. different issue. But, uh, you know, the whole like rising threat of Christian nationalism uh, completely ignores the fact that the Republican base is, is actually less Christian than it ever has been. So. Yeah, 50% is actually a super depressing number. That Those are rookie numbers. We got to pump up those numbers, boys. Um, but let's see. Glow in the Dark here again for $2. Thank you very much. Continuous Cultural Revolution circa 2023. Yep, we're always in year zero around here. Uh, Glow in the Dark, thanks again, man. Bulwark, uh, make concessions or you are far right. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know who the... Bul so, I, I mean, I know who the Bulwark is for in some sense, right? It's It's for people who want to read um, a right-coded criticism of uh, of conservatism. But like, are there any conservatives who actually read the bulwark? It, this is just for New York Times readers who want to pretend like they have some level of balance, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the dispatch is to the right of, of the bulwark. Like the bulwark is not, it's, it's, it's almost cliche to say the bulwark is like not conservative anymore, right? Because it, right. it hasn't been pretty much since its founding. But that's why I, I you know, this response to the, this bulwark piece I wrote was an exception I made. I tried to ignore them most of the time because it's not a good faith publication. It was founded by a bunch of disgruntled neoconservatives who were angry that the Republican Party wasn't listening to them anymore, or at least was listening to them left. And since then, it's basically just been a platform for enacting those resentments against the Republican Party. Uh, right. it, it's not really, it doesn't really have any coherent principles. Uh, most of the stuff they write isn't particularly interesting or new. Um, it's, it's, it's all sort of the, this weird pretense of false centrism that isn't rooted in any real principles and is just uh, pretending to be in the middle of a, of a rapidly leftward shifting uh, cultural dynamic. Uh, Creeper Weirdo here for $5. A friendly reminder, when society is so far left, any shift to the right feels like theocracy. And yeah, that, that's, of course, the beautiful thing about what the left has done. You, you got to give them credit where credit is due. They've managed to turn, you know, radical progressivism into the null hypothesis, right? We, we know that separation of state, at least under the new liberal definition, uh, that somehow all conservatives have managed to onboard, which is just super depressing, that the separation of church and state means that any kind of uh, religious value is immediately theocracy. So the left gets to push every one of its radical viewpoints, every one of its moral dictates and treat them as secular. So they aren't impacted by the constitution and any kind of right-wing value is immediately theocratic. It's a nice game and it makes it very easy for them to pretend like they're pointing to something like the constitution for validity. Right. And the whole null hypothesis thing, I've written a little bit about this as well, is why, uh, the right is always framed as the aggressor in the culture war. Like if mm -hmm. you saw this with the whole gas stove freak out, right? They said they wanted to ban gas stoves and a bunch of conservatives noticed that they said that. And then it was like, oh, the right is bringing, you know, gas stoves in the culture war. It's like, it's because the continual leftwards movement uh, of the side that's on the right side of history, because history only has one direction, that's just neutral. And any reaction to it or even noticing that it's happening, that's when it becomes the culture war. Uh, you see it in pretty much every, every sphere of politics. Yeah, I have some friends who are like, well, the culture war is always a distraction. There, there's always something more meaningful. And, and I just fundamentally disagree. The culture war is how all this more meaningful stuff got smuggled in, right? Over and over again, this cultural ratchet has then enabled the degradation of forms that allows the other parts of the progressive agenda to get implemented. So the culture war is one of the key entry points of all the other stuff you hate. Far from being some kind of silly focus to distract you, it's actually the entry point for, for all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. Uh, Creeper Widow here for $5. Republicans could elect Jesus Christ with Fred Rogers as VP and left would still hate anything the right does. I got a million of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously... Any Republican, any right winger, anyone who's trying to build some kind of consensus by reaching to the left is just playing a fool's game, right? Like these people hate you. Uh, and I was tweeting about this yesterday when it comes to, you know, many, many Christians who are trying to play this game. Like, look, the, just say the truth, right? And, and maybe the truth isn't politically right wing. That's fine. But, but just tell the truth 
for your Christian beliefs because the left hates you, right? They, 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 they know you're the, on the wrong side. They know you're the enemy. Whether you understand it or not, they know who you are. And so there's just no reason to play these games anymore. You know, it is, it's just very foolish to believe that you're going to strike the right balance. You're going to create the right frame. You're going to put together the right rhetorical response. And all of a sudden, the left's going to be like, oh, okay, no, we can live with these people. We're done with the revolution. We'll just put our arms down. It's not going to happen. Yeah, no, the truth doesn't change with uh, political or cultural convenience, even if only one person in the world believes that it, it's still the truth, right? So if conservatives aren't going to defend that, then then nobody is, and we really, we really are lost. Uh, Atraxi here for $2 says, anybody's monitor break upon seeing uh, Nikki's uh, POTUS ad? Yeah, I mean, this one is uh, just just an embarrassment. It's, it, what, what I love is that even uh, mainstream conservatives kind of already realize that this is just going nowhere. Um, but it, it, you know, she's got enough money. She's got, she's got enough people who are signed on to the chamber of commerce, Republican wing to kind of pay consultants for a while. And so I think this is just going to happen no matter what the good news is like, it's doomed to fail. So you might as well just enjoy the lulls, you know, just, just go ahead and, and, uh, you know, dunk on it while you have the opportunity, but because soon it will be gone and you'll no longer be able to enjoy the, the kind of the clown show that is the, the attempt at, at running here. I don't know. Some people have told me I, I, I don't give enough credit that there there really is a chance of, of Nikki Haley breaking through, but I, I'm pretty doubtful. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? No, I mean, I look, anything can happen, right? Like maybe sure. there's a massive <laughs> undiscovered Nikki Haley constituency in the GOP voter base. I don't <laughs> think there is. Yeah. Um, but her opening ad was a perfect example we've been talking about in terms of concession to left-wing premises. Like it started by talking about like, oh, I grew up on the wrong side of the train tracks and it was this dividing line. And, uh, you know, and that was supposed to be this metaphor for, I, I assume, sort of systemic racism. And then she goes on to be like, you know, they say America is a racist country. You know, they say that our founding principles are racist. And then the ad ends. Right? Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no like, what some wrong, say. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Like, there's no, but like, but they're wrong. And here's why. It's just like, well, they say it. Right. It's like, great. Like, I'm glad that our conservative fighters in the year of our Lord 2023. <laughs> are basically opening their presidential campaigns by, by, by seeding left-wing premises. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, I think we hit everything. Again, I want to thank Nate for coming on. Make sure that you're following him on Twitter and checking out all of his work. And of course, if you enjoyed this, go ahead and hit like, go ahead and subscribe if you're not subscribed to the channel yet. And if you want to listen to these as podcasts, make sure that you're going to your favorite podcast platforms and signing up for the Oren McIntyre show. If you do, go ahead and make sure that you leave a rating and a review that really helps. I've got a new piece out on the blaze. You can check that out. That came out yesterday. And guys, as always, we appreciate you. We appreciate you coming by. And I'll talk to you next time.